Monday, March 2nd, 2020, City of Bellevue uh, uh, City Council study session. We were just in executive session, so thank you for waiting for us. We are now on to our study session items. Mr. Miyaki, would you like to introduce? Sure. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. The first item on your agenda is uh, an informational overview of the uh, privately initiated, the proposed uh, comprehensive plan amendments for uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, just by way of background, each year the city conducts uh, its annual comprehensive plan amendment process over the course of a year. And this includes uh, proposed privately initiated amendments. The annual amendment process involves a number of review and evaluation steps that involve both the council and the planning commission. You're gonna hear more about that process this evening. Tonight's briefing provides the council members with an overview of the proposed uh, privately initiated amendments that the Planning Commission will be examining in the near term. So joining us this evening is Emil King, the Assistant Director in, our, um, in Community Development, as well as Nicholas Matz, our Senior Planner. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emil. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Miyaki, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Robinson and the rest of council for having us here tonight. Um, I'll just give a couple brief comments uh, to introduce this. So uh, tonight is our first introduction of the privately initiated applications uh, for the comprehensive plan for council. Um, Bellevue's comprehensive plan is a very important guiding document for the city, and we do have a clear process for consideration of potential amendments. Uh, Nicholas Matz, uh, sitting to my right, is the project manager for this effort, and he'll be able to walk you through the process and overview of the five applications. The intake process that we used this year was guided heavily by your update to the actual application process that you made late last year. So Nicholas will be able to update you on that work that you did as well. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nicholas. Thank you, Emil. Mayor, members of council, um, this year, we received five privately initiated site-specific proposed plan amendments by the city's January, January 31st, 2020 deadline. We're gonna give you an informational overview in three parts tonight. We're gonna spend a little time on the annual plan amendment process. Um, it's, we've found it very helpful to always provide refresher courses to everyone involved in the plan amendment process. Um, it's, it's worth doing. We're also, we'll give you a little bit of background information on the five sites that are coming before the Planning Commission and ultimately will be coming before you in threshold review. And then we'll advise you on what's next over the course of this first part of the plan review process. So with our annual amendment process, we have specific steps and a general timeline. The Growth Management Act asks us to make sure that our comprehensive plan aligns with our zoning and with our future development plans uh, throughout the city. These specific steps that are involved include a two-part review process uh, of known as threshold review and final review. Threshold review is where we spend the time deciding about whether we should be spending more time on a comp plan amendment. Threshold review lets us set a threshold of whether or not we're gonna actually invest time and effort in comprehensive plan amendment review. Uh, applications that go on go to final review where we spend much more time on the merits of that review and we bring in more of the city's uh, staff expertise in areas such as transportation and utilities uh, planning. We also do these no more frequently than once per year. So although it's a year long process, the Growth Management Act again asks us to make sure that we look at the cumulative effect of all of these plan amendments on our comprehensive plan. So at the end of the day, you are actually making one amendment to the comprehensive plan consisting of uh, various uh, uh, actions that you choose to take. As I mentioned, Threshold Review evaluates these applications. This is the phase we're currently in right now. The Planning Commission just was introduced to them on February 26th at, a, at an introductory study session. And Final Review examines the merits of those uh, applications. Each of them has a Planning Commission hearing, a staff recommendation, and a public hearing. And each of them has council, City Council action. For Threshold Review, you will be um, taking action to set up what's called the work program based on the recommendations that the Planning Commission takes forward to you. Um, as Emil mentioned before, um, a primary purpose of our comprehensive plan amendment process is to engage residents and stakeholders and communities in our plan amendment process. It's a key component of the Growth Management Act, again, that we have early and continuous public engagement uh, in that process. It's uh, featured around the central role of the Planning Commission as, as your uh, body acting on, on the legislative actions associated with the comprehensive plan and its amendment. We also focus our engagement on specific tools that our, that our stakeholders uh, ask and that they take advantage of, including our planning commissions and our plan amendment websites. 
um, as well as our parties of interest. Anyone who wants to um, be informed about plan amendment actions, um, besides obviously the, the owner and agent, uh, gets on these parties of interest lists. We make sure that they get all the information they need to participate and engage in this process at their level. And finally, we use a multi-pronged noticing process in partnership with, with our colleagues in development services to make sure that public notice is properly given for hearings and, and as well as any other actions associated with that noticing. And finally, as Emil referenced, this is the first year we're seeing implementation of council adopted code amendments that you took last year, uh, the, the conference plan amendment land use code process, including revising the, the, the impact of the three-year limit on applications the new 5th, September 15th deadline, although that's not applied for this year's plan amendments process, we've made a migration to seeing that happen so that now we are actually um, soliciting plan amendments for 2021, but that gives us a lot more breathing room, a lot more ability to get the data and the information that commissioners and applicants need to be able to make informed decisions. And finally, you had a ban on amendments in great neighborhoods, initiated neighborhoods. In this case, it's Northwest Bellevue, Northeast Bellevue. We didn't get any, so that part of it worked. Um, but in terms of the three-year limit and the September 15th deadline, <clears throat> I think those really helped people get intentional about their applications. So what we had this year were no surprises. We had plan amendment applications, owners and applicants and communities coming in and saying, what's going on? What are we talking about here? So I think it was really important to sort of calm that down with that bigger stick. And what we got were plan amendments that um, people have thought through before they've submitted them to us. And I think that's a really important change that, that you initiated with, these, with the code amendment focus. So, the five 2020s. So I'm, I'm showing you a big map here. We're gonna show you smaller maps in more detail in a minute here, but just we start with this big map to show people the effect. This is a citywide process. When we consider these, although we're considering them as individual projects, we're also looking at it through the citywide policy lens of the comprehensive plan. And this year we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have five. We have our first one at 100 Bellevue Way Southeast. It's not the jack-in-the-box, it's the property south of that, and it's split by a downtown and an office designation, and the owners want to bring those together. Um, their application is um, for, from, down, from the mix to a complete downtown designation. The second project, um, and I'm presenting these in the order that they came in, so um, is Safeguard Self Storage. You might be familiar with the uh, storage facility up in Crossroads, right off of Crossroads Park, uh, behind the Salvation Army on 164th. Um, the, those folks for years have been uh, frustrated by the fact that their existing use is uh, uh, non-conforming with the office designation. They were looking for another designation that um, would help them more align with what they want to do with the property. The third is that we're calling the Northeast 8th Street Partners. I also don't name these. So I take the name of the application as it comes in. So some of them, <laughs> we're not sure. Northeast 8th Street Partners, it's two lots on the south side of 8th, right as you crest up uh, the hill going east on 8th, there's a veterinarian office and another uh, two-story office building. Both of those sites are office designated, surrounded by multifamily. The owner of the property is looking to uh, develop multifamily. Uh, the Capella property that redesignation, it's the uh, Betty Lou Capella property up in Bridal Trails at the very north edge of the city on 140th, and then of course um, bounded by uh, Kirkland to the north. Those, those um, folks came in on the strength of a policy in the Bridal Trail sub-area plan that talks about contemplating multifamily uses if the form of that multifamily takes some sort of senior housing um, approach. And then finally, we have the Glendale Country Club Northeast application. Um, it's a little, it's a corner, and I'll, I'll show you more detail on the map. It's a little corner of their, the property of the Country Club there, fronting on 8th, um, adjacent to the um, power corridor. Um, they're looking to convert that into some uh, multifamily designation. So again, very quickly, you have this in your packets. This information is also available on our website. This is our single sheet that summarizes the, the, the 2020s. We found it's a useful tool for folks to get more information and to find out more what they need about it, all in, all in, one, all in one place. So 100 Bellevue Way Southeast. Um, let's turn on my, where is that, is it this one? There, this is, this is Main Street here, Bellevue Way Southeast. This is the old Jack in the Box site. This is the, the property under consideration. This is the specific property right here, surrounded in red. This is the downtown boundary. So 
What they're looking for is to go from the mixed use, which is the downtown mixed use designation to the north of downtown boundary, and office to the south, and make that all a downtown mixed use uh, pr project. Their intent there is to recognize the, the uh, gateway function of the intersection there in the downtown Siberia plan, as well as to look uh, um, favorably on other Main Street redevelopment that's been occurring on the south side of Main Street. Safeguard self-storage. Again, here's 164th, Northeast 8th Street, Crossroads Park, Crossroads Mall and Center. This is the site itself. It's a, it's a fairly large site. Um, the, the previous uh, uh, 100 Bellevue Way site was a little less than an acre. This one's about six and a half acres. Um, and again, here's the Salvation Army to the Orient Youth Salvation Army here. Uh, the YES is here. Uh, Bellevue, Bellevue Golf Course is here. This is all existing multifamily here. Uh, the proposal there is to go from the office designation to community business, which they believe will allow them to get a, a mixed use project such as is contemplated by the Crossroads sub area plan in these other areas of Crossroads. Um, I think the, the simplest way to um, identify what they're seeking is it's very similar to what the Toll Brothers built um, on, the, on Crossroads up here to the north, the project that just opened up here right off of 15th. Um, and CB actually uh, with the Crossroads tools in place associated with um, a development um, agreement and other such tools gives them the ability to make that argument um, in terms of what, what, what would work best. Office to community business. The Northeast 8th Street Partners site, again, here's 8th, 140th, Walgreens, you're coming up the hill here. It's these two properties right here with the veterinarian and the office uh, complex right there. This is all various levels of multifamily. Here's the neighborhood church, by the way. This is their property here. Um, but all of this is all multifamily at a 10, 15, and 20 units per acre designation. And there's a tiny bit of our 30 as well. Um, and their designation is, I don't think that's me. Their designation is office to multifamily high that they're requesting. The Capella property redesignation, 140th, the city boundary up here at Northeast 60th. This is 6001, for those of you familiar with, the, with that um, uh, uh, multifamily complex up to the north. This is uh, the Betty Lou Capella property, the existing uh, horse uh, ranch business over here in the home to the left. The property that's before <laughs> us um, is this 30-acre parcel outlined in red here. Um, the entirety of the policy, which is SBT 54, um, suggests that the 40-acre parcel, which is basically this portion right here, could have that consideration for that multifamily designation associated with some type of senior housing. So we'll be um, raising that question um, about the, uh, how to use that policy here um, 40 years on and, and see uh, where, where it takes us. That, re that designation request is single-family low to multifamily low. Finally, the Glendale Country Club Northeast. Um, this is, this is, here's the Country Club, Northeast 8th. This, this was the um, other Northeast 8th partner site right here. And what they're talking about here is carving off roughly three and a third acres right here and to um, go from single family low to multifamily medium um, along that site. So what we have coming up next, our timeline from left to right, um, we've already received and published our list of applications, so our noticing process is well underway. Um, we've already received a number of public comments and we're directing people towards their participation in the Planning Commission's uh, review. We've provided that introductory briefing to the Planning Commission on February 26th, and we'll be going back to them on March 25th. Uh, tonight's uh, briefing memo to you here, and then back to Planning Commission uh, to begin the study session review on March 25th. Our intent is to hold public hearings on the five applications in May or June so that we can come back to you with a request for threshold review action um, in June. With that, I'm just advising again, tonight is informational. The Planning Commission's threshold review period is gonna take approximately three months. And as I mentioned, we'll, at, we'll be coming back to you and likely in June with a recommendation to establish the annual work program. Great, thank you. So this is just informational, but if we have questions or comments about this, I entertain that you can raise your hand or let me know. Go ahead, council members on. Well, actually, my only comment is, is 
good to know that our uh, code amendments are having an effect in that uh, we are only seeing ones that um, have more viability than than a fishing expedition. So um, I'm excited about that. Thank good you. Dear. Look forward to um, uh, the Planning Commission's work and coming back with their recommendations. Thanks. Councilmember Barksdale. Uh, I don't have any burning questions since I've seen it, but looking forward to the feedback that we can incorporate into the discussion with Planning Commission. Councilmember Lee. Yeah, that line already closed? Yes, it has. For this year? Yes, it has. It was January okay. 31st, Councilmember. Okay. So it would be, what, three years, or they can do it next year? Right, so all of the applications yeah. made that complete thing, so all of these applications now are subject to the three-year limit. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Robertson. Thank you. Um, on the... Um, one that's on Bellevue Way, 100 Bellevue Way. Yeah. Is, we've been cleaning up a lot of the split zones there. Is there any other split zone properties still in existence on the southern we've, downtown we've, boundary? We've inquired of our GTS council member, and we're going to have that information back both for you and Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. There are a number of other properties, nothing left on the downtown boundary, but there are another, a number of other split zonings throughout the city, and so we're looking at that. Yeah, it'd be good to have a, a holistic look yeah. at that apart from this. Okay. But, um, yeah, I just didn't know if there were any other split zone. It's going to be the Planning Commission's recommendation if we enlarge geographic scope. But Correct. I was surprised that we had any left. Yeah, we, we still have a handful, but they're out there. But, but, we, but this is the last one on the southern downtown boundary? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to going through the process. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Uh, no questions for me, but uh, Nicholas and Demil, thank you for the presentation, and uh, look forward to seeing the uh, recommendations from the Planning Commission. Okay, I'm really excited about this. It's like what what a great opportunity to put new housing in Bellevue. So, I'm excited that um, the work we did previously is working in a positive way for us, and we have a process for putting in this housing. I'm interested in two things, and I don't know if there's any way to influence it, but I would love to see an active senior community at the Capella property. We just we only have one active senior community in Bellevue, and that's Silver Glen, and it only has 90 units. So for people who could downsize, it would be great to have places for them to go. And I'm very interested in um, seeing if we can put in um, a requirement for a percentage of affordable housing in these properties or a fee in lieu, a, a choice of that, because we are giving uh, the opportunity for people to develop in a way they couldn't develop before. And so it would be great if we could get in return some affordable housing or some a fee in lieu for our affordable housing fund. So can you speak to those two thoughts? Yeah, the, the, the first comment will, um, I guess, take that into consideration when we're running this through the process, so the kind of interest in the, the active senior community. And then we're going to uh, begin our kind of internal staff due diligence about the ideas if we can uh, have any of these actions tied to any type of affordable housing um, provisions or in lieu provisions. So we'll begin the staff work on that. Okay, thank you. I don't want to miss the boat on that. All right, any other Comments, Councilmember Stokes. Yeah, um, you may have answered this while I was out. I sort of had a call I had to take. Um, what are the two stars on Northeast Eighth Partners of Glendale? I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out, Councilmember. Those are stars are indicating that those two projects are in the jurisdiction of the East Bellevue Community Council. That's what I thought. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I'm looking at the map. It looks like. Okay. And I want to echo and I'd agree with uh, the mayor on those two points she made. It'd be very interested in seeing that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is our uh, Vision Zero Action Plan. Mr. Bianchi. Zero traffic deaths as well as fatalities by 2030 was adopted by council in 2015. Um, since then, council has taken several actions directing the staff as well as the Transportation Commission to undertake measures in order to realize this vision. Uh, tonight, staff is seeking council approval as well as direction to further Bellevue's Vision Zero efforts to return to a future council meeting with a resolution approving additional strategies as well as um, uh, a plan, which is being recommended by the Transportation Commission. So joining us this evening is a number of folks here. Um, most importantly, our, our chair of our Transportation Commission, Lei Wu, as well as the vice chair, uh, Lisa Leitner, 
um, to, as well as Andrew Singalakis, our transportation director, and Franz Lowenhaus, our principal <coughs> transportation planner. That'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Andrew. Yep. <coughs> Thank you, uh, City Manager Miyaki, uh, Mayor Robinson, and the City Council. Um, tonight, the Transportation Commission and the Transportation Department is uh, seeking council approval for a, a safe systems approach and strategies to move uh, Bellevue toward Vision Zero. Um, a draft resolution is attached to the agenda memo. Uh, that incorporates this, require, this uh, requested direction. It's attachment B in your packets. Um, an impending uh, council direction after this work session, staff will bring back the resolution uh, for adoption at a future meeting. And here it is. <clears throat> Uh, the presentation begins with uh, Lei Wu, the chair of the Transportation Commission, who will review background information in the process the commission worked through in arriving at their recommendation to the council. Uh, Lisa Leitner, the vice chair of the Transportation Commission, will then offer a summary of the safe systems uh, strategies. Uh, both Lee and Lisa will then offer concluding remarks on their transmittal letter, letter to the council, which is attachment A in your, your packet. And then finally, Franz uh, Lowenhurst will speak to the staff's next step in finalizing and then implementing the Vision Zero action plan. <clears throat> uh, staff and Transportation Commission's Vision Zero work is informed by uh, direction in the Comprehensive Plan 2, and it's up there, develop a programmatic approach to Vision Zero that integrates components of education, encouragement, enforcement, engineering, equity, and evaluation. Um, approving the Commission's recommendation uh, with this, the systems approach builds upon this by articulating what steps staff should pursue to strive to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries by uh, 2030 in Bellevue. Uh, pending Council approval of the safe system approach and strategy, we'll finalize an action plan, which is largely uh, an administrative type of matter. Uh, the council will, won't really see it again until, unless there's a need to change policy through implementation of the action plan. And with that, uh, Chair Wu will now review some of the background data and the process that led to the commission's recommendation. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Uh, it's uh, on behalf of the Transportation Commission. It's my honor to speak with you about our work on Vision Zero. So at the um, at the beginning of our work, we uh, took a look at um, crash pattern uh, in the city of Bellevue. So this slide shows the number of fatal and serious injury crashes, also known as KSI, uh, per 100,000 population. The orange, orange line at the very bottom of this slide shows uh, where Bellevue has been between 2010 and 2018. The purple or Darkish line shows uh, the trend for our state as a whole. As you can see, Bellevue has been at less than half of the statewide average. So, relatively, Bellevue um, has a safe transportation system, but no one should uh, get harmed on city streets while get getting where they need to go. You know, even one family ne ne uh, member, neighbor, friend co-worker or loved one lost is too many. So we can all agree that um, KSI, fatal and serious injury crashes on our streets uh, are unacceptable and can be prevented. So, um, so the recommendation for us um, complete, uh, completes important steps in the six step process. And also, our work is based on council policy direction, data, and industry-based practices. In the rest of this presentation, we'll touch on each of the process steps and each of the major work elements uh, real briefly to you. So in terms of um, leadership, uh, in 2015, um, uh, council direction, uh, council established policy direction uh, for this, uh, to start this process. Um, the, in Resolution 1935, the policy direction is that uh, to strive to achieve uh, zero uh, traffic death and injuries on Bellevue City streets uh, by 2030. Subsequently, in 2016, uh, Council adopted uh, um, Vision Zero amendments into the comprehensive plan. At the time of uh, 
in adopting those uh, amendments, council directed staff to prepare and implement a Vision Zero action plan. So that's the policy direction. And then, um, so uh, together with staff, we uh, carefully considered uh, Bellevue crash data. So two examples on this slide. Uh, one is uh, the one is uh, streets in red that have high occurrence of uh, fatal of fatality and serious uh, injuries. And then the other is um, is the top, the pie chart shows top five behaviors contributing to 70% of uh, fatality and serious injuries. So um, in addition to uh, technical analysis of crash data, staff also organized a community engagement that has um, received uh, good, uh, good responses. Um, staff conducted in-person and online questionnaires uh, seeking input on Vision Zero priorities. Uh, so that the questionnaire from the community received uh, a little bit uh, lower, just shy of uh, 1,500 responses. And then, so um, in addition, we uh, we took a look. You know, we vetted uh, the ongoing safety effort practices uh, already used in the city of Bellevue. We also took a look at um, uh, the best practices around the, the world. So uh, there was a summit organized, all day summit organized by staff at Overlake Med uh, Medical Center. You know, over uh, 30 presentations were offered by. Um, Industry leaders, you know, coming from um, as far as Canada um, on the East Coast. Uh, so those presentations offered us uh, valuable insights about our proposed safe systems approach and strategies. So, um, in terms of uh, the approach, um, so um, it took us five meetings. To, uh, to deliberate on the safe systems approach and strategies. Um, um, it took us a while because we wanted to figure out what works for Bellevue and how to make it work well for our community. Um, so research uh, by a number of uh, organizations such as the Institute of Transportation Engineers, World Bank, and others show that communities that have adopted safe systems approach um, have achieved a greater reduction in uh, fatalities compared to its peer communities. Uh, in fact, um, because of its demonstrated success in uh, uh, moving toward zero, uh, there's a growing number of acceptance of this approach by communities. Um, one is um, our the state's very own Washington Traffic Safety Committee. Um, Adopted, incorporated this approach into the 2019 Target Zero Plan. That's uh, you know for the state of Washington. So um, in the center, in the heart of uh, the safe systems approach, is really the notion that um, the effort to achieve uh, Vision Zero includes everybody. Uh, beyond that, uh, there are four pillars. Um, it's safe people, safe vehicles, safe uh, speeds, and safe streets. Um, uh, those uh, efforts in uh, all pillars uh, are needed uh, to um, to um, reduce the frequency and severity of crashes. Uh, that is, uh, new te vehicle technologies, uh, improved street infrastructure, a lower uh, vehicular speed, and enhanced public awareness of traffic safety. Um, so beyond those four pillars, there are four elements that uh, support there are four supportive elements. That's leadership, data, partnership, and culture. So it's really a, uh, about uh, the idea that the res responsibility for safe systems approach is shared. Leaders make challenging decisions when traffic safety is at stake. Staff, in collaboration with the community, leverages new technologies, monitors data closely to assess uh, results and performance and it creates partnerships with uh, the public and private sectors. And all party, parties develop a safety uh, culture that acknowledges zero as the only acceptable number of death and serious injuries on our streets. So um, that's the, that's, um, let's say that's 
say first level of recommendation to you that's part of the safe systems approach now vice chair lechner will review with you the safe systems strategies thank you lay uh, good evening mayor deputy mayor council members it's a pleasure to be here tonight um nestled within the safe systems approach excuse me there's a lot of s's in there um there are 36 strategies, and those strategies are really going to um, are really going to hone in on the action items that are going to come out of all of this. That's 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 truly what's what's going to make it uh, a worthwhile endeavor by by the city and by our by our residents. Um, there's one important component that I would just want to chime in here one second, and that is there's three principles that we applied. We wanted these to be aspirational, achievable, and accountable. So those are the those are kind of the um, the, the pieces that we apply to every one of these strategies as we uh, develop these alongside the staff. So, for safe people, which I believe is here, these involve educating the uh, and educating and engaging the public and encouraging those to take personal responsibility in Vision Zero. That includes um, engaging our mascot, uh, Pedby. We have participation in community events to build it's awareness around safety, really as well as producing the right amount of signage, videos, um, and other media that will engage people to, uh, to uh, follow the rules of the road. We then have our safe streets strategies, and the, um, the visuals that you see that represent up there are going to be places like neighborhood crossing um, projects. Uh, an, in, an image up there is 164th and Interlake, uh, if that doesn't look familiar to any of you. We have constructing roundabouts in our communities, as well as implementing projects that um, separate vulnerable users, such as our pedestrian and our bike riders. We then move on to safe speeds, and our safe speed strategies involve implementing, educating about, and enforcing speeds that reduce the risk of bodily harm for both people inside and outside of vehicles. So we can um, uh, take further action on that by, again, providing traffic calming projects. We can install school beacons to slow down traffic within our neighborhoods, as well as um, enforcement actions, um, as you see represented there by our finest. Safe vehicle strategies. So this is this is going to involve implementing and influencing improvements to vehicle design and as well as technologies that reduce the risk of injury to people inside and outside of vehicles. So representative actions um, would include engaging with technology companies and agents, agency partners, such as the Washington State Autonomous Vehicle Work Group and through the Washington Traffic Safety Commission to consider opportunities that demonstrate um, how we can apply new technologies. We can also um, see our efforts to promote transit sign usage in Bellevue as um, a strategy that would provide public transportation that has less than a tenth of a mile traffic casual casualty, um, which is injury or death, um, as an uh, as a rate as an autumn Mobile travel. I stumbled on that one. There's a lot of words in that. My apologies. <laughs> lot to cover. As we start looking at that outer circle, um, these are where the cultural strategies are going to come into play. So we need to um, develop shared language and understanding about traffic crashes, which begins by acknowledging that zero is the only number acceptable in this in this in this endeavor. And it's important that we um, achieve this goal by reaching out to, to our other cultures and making this communication accessible to them. We can host forums like the Vision Zero Summit that Lay referred, referred to. We can have one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations within our, within our own neighborhoods and our communities, as well as soliciting ideas and solutions through questionnaires that um, have led to a shared sense of commitment to, uh, to this endeavor, to Vision Zero. We have the partnership strategies. So um, in this particular um, slide, we want to make sure that we're representing both the city and the broader Vision Zero community. And I believe um, in the 8 o'clock hour, you're actually going to get to hear from um, one of the people pictured in this, in this uh, slide. So I 
I will wait uh, and share more information. She will share more information with you. But I think it's important to note here that young drivers account for 25% of the drivers involved in serious um, collisions or fatal incidents in our city, and that's just unacceptable. We also have a distracted driving um, situation within our within our community when we have 20% of the fatal and serious collisions in, uh, associated with distracted by driving in our city. Also unacceptable. <clears throat> Data strategies. So this is this is actually a very interesting video. We've watched this numerous times as we've as we've assessed this um, during our conversations. It's can you thank you. <laughs> you can make that go again. Appreciate that. Um, so it's important for us to collect and analyze the data to understand the factors that impact our safety. So this action video actually shows um, the conflict from numerous events like uh, what, what occurs here in this video multiple times at 156th and Northeast 8th. And the, I, I can't recall the actual speeds that were involved in some of these that we've watched. 77 kilometers. 77 kilometers. I just can't imagine that on, on Northeast 8th and 156, mm. but that's, that's the speed. <laughs> That's in miles per hour. What would that be? 40. 40. 45. 45. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't know kilometers. <laughs> um, but that's that's truly representative of, of the, the <clears throat> need for data as we start making these assessments and we start diving diving down and, and creating action items for for both uh, the transportation department, the commission, as well as our community. The leadership strategies. So this commits all levels of the city to learn, refine, and expand our toolbox to ensure that these strategies, policies, and actions um, come to be. So these are the types of actions that come about through our neighborhood safety, uh, connectivity, and congestion levy, levy, excuse me. And we also see visionary products like the Grand Connection, the Mountains to Sound Greenway, East Trail um, as contributing to the city where more of us can safely walk, bicycle, and access transit. Um, great picture from our last meeting of your Transportation Commission. Um, this is where we voted in unanimously. I wanted to make sure I was on the right slide here, so my apologies, that we voted unanimously to recommend um, council approve our safe systems approach. And I personally want to add a couple of comments here, and that is um, we um, spent a lot of time going over the strategies, the words in the strategies, to ensure that this is meaningful and something that all of us can be proud of. And I think the end result was that, that we voted unanimously to, to bring this before you tonight. And I just want to say thank you for all of the work to my commissioners as well as to um, uh, Council Member Lee for all of the work and support that we received to make this actually happen. Leah? Um, thank you. Uh, I would like to... Um Kind of first thank uh, Council Member Lee for his guidance um, to the Transportation Commission. He um, he has very high standards, high expectation of the Transportation Commission, um, and he spends the time and uh, energy to help us to get there. Um, each of us, the Transportation Commission overall has received lots of uh, guidance and help from him. Each of us individually has benefited a great deal from his um, coaching advice. Uh, so we really appreciate you. We're also so excited to welcome uh, Council Member Robinson. I know that Council Member Robinson serves on uh, a, a number of uh, really important uh, regional transportation commissions, boards, and communities. So uh, we believe that having a council member who is uh, very much dyed in on the regional level as well as deeply uh, immersed in like in our Bellevue city issues is a great uh, advantage toward the city of Bellevue. So welcome. And also, so that's my th Do you have a card? I yeah. do. <laughs> um, so while that's going on, I would also like to appreciate uh, my... Um, So appreciate, uh, I express my appreciation for the depth and uh, uh, breadth of the work that staff has brought to the commission, to the community. Um, 
you know, of course, professional expertise is what makes um, the work solid. But, but I, I really uh, believe that staff's passion and commitment to safety is what makes the work excellent. Um, and it's, it's, you know, your so the passion that I see and all, all of the rest of the commission see really uh, speaks to us, resonates with us. Um, so uh, we're just so incredibly proud of uh, the work and the uh, you know the top not uh, not professionals leaders that we have in the transportation department. Also, would like to express uh, gratitude toward her uh, community participation in the process. Um, we had five meetings working on this project. Everybody supported this project. So uh, there, there are meetings that uh, there were a room full of people. Everybody uh, adapted with his. Kid, um, an emergency uh, facility care worker, um, um, seasoned cyclists, they they came up and they shared their personal experience. Um, you know, they, they 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 were not mad at anything. They showed up because they cared deeply. So we're very, very thankful. We are very humbled by uh, the kind of support um, uh, and the care for the community. So thank you. Hans? Wonderful. Thank. You. Thank you, Chair Wu, Vice Chair Leitner, um, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Uh, very briefly to wrap up where we're headed with this pending Council approval uh, of the safe systems approach and strategies. Uh, staff will be very well positioned at that point to have clarity on Bellevue's programmatic approach and be in a position to finalize the action plan, commence work on collaborations to, to move this forward. Uh, and uh, moving forward, we envision leveraging data to assess uh, the strategies and actions to determine are these the most effective uh, safety outcomes. And, and we're well positioned to uh, and committed to reporting to Commission and Council on our progress towards zero moving forward. And with that, we conclude with the direction needed from you uh, reflected in um, the transmittal letter, letter attachment A and the draft resolution in attachment B. Pending your direction, we're prepared to return to you at a future meeting for adoption. Great. Thank you very much, and Chair Wu and Vice Chair Leitner, thank you so much for being here tonight. I would like to give uh, Council Member Robertson for first stab at this and then Council Member Lee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thanks for coming tonight. I always love it when transportation is on the agenda. Um, great presentation. Um, it's good to see that Bellevue is, in this case, you know, the lower the number, the better we are and that we are ahead of the curve. Of course, we want to always make sure that our roads are safe for everybody. Um, so, but I appreciated the graph on page five. So, um, one of the things I'll just add, add uh, from my perspective, the, at the regional level, we are doing a um, updated transportation plan for the region. It's one of the things Puget Sound Regional Council Transportation Policy Board is working on. And one of the things I've added and that we've had a discussion at that board has to do with making sure that all of the streets are safer because we are seeing increased fatalities on many roadways, not just in Bellevue, so across the state. And um, so I learned from that process that King County, Bellevue, and DOT, WSDOT are three of the agencies that are really leading on this. I think the city of Seattle as well. Um, so I'm hoping that whatever the result of this work, that we make sure that we feed it into the regional system so that it can be um, useful as part of developing the regional transportation plan. The more data we have, the more um, great policy work that this this body has done. Smaller cities can learn from that, um, as well as helping to influence the regional plan. I think that that is something. Bellevue's a leader in many things, and I think this is another opportunity to do so um, in a way that's really productive for the whole region. So I just wanted to add that at the beginning. Um, so uh, one of the discussions we had um, last time was um, not last time, but a couple of meetings ago, 
was about how the 911 system is hooked into um, transportation system. When, when there's accidents on the road, transportation's getting alerted to that. And we had a discussion about that on whether we could potentially in the future, as we since we have cameras at all of our intersections, whether we could be utilizing that with, Franz, you weren't here that night, and neither was the Transportation Commission, but with our video analytics or with AI to really see that, I mean, that accident or that almost accident, mm -hmm. If we didn't have video of that, we wouldn't know. No one was hurt, mm -hmm. no one was hit, but we wouldn't know that. And if there's lots of that at that intersection every day, then we need to know that so that we can potentially do some engineering to help those near misses. I know the work, Franz, you were doing with the near misses, and it's really great. So I'm hoping that we can really use all of those tools on these near misses to help inform and figure out the areas where we might need some more engineering, more education, or more um, enforcement. So um, uh, that said, I think that the set of criteria is very good. Um, I think implementation is going to be the key to success. Um, how we implement those, um, there are things, for example, if the implementation is to get rid of all the roadway lanes in Bellevue, I'm not saying we're doing that, that would be co concerning to me, right? I mean, so we need to make sure that we implement it in a way that makes the system safer, but that also maintains mobility. And that's my perspective, because um, we're only going to get busier and we're only going to have more jobs. So I don't know if an answer is figuring out the orientations of different corridors. So some are more pedestrian oriented or bike lane oriented. And some are, you know, I think that that kind of work and implementation is going to be really, really important. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I'm hoping that this work will be uh, it, leading ahead of the potential for, I know it's going to be a budget proposal, the, a citywide transportation plan, and that this work then could feed into a citywide transportation plan where um, we are looking at the functionality of all those intersections, but also the safety. Mm -hmm. So I think that that would be a really good body of work to um, do. So. Um, again, I know you guys have been working on this far longer than when I've, I just took over as liaison a month ago. But um, so Council Member Lee may have a lot more to say, but I really appreciate how much effort the staff and the Transportation Commission has put into getting this set of um, recommendations. And um, really thank you. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Followed by Council Members. Well, I'm very touched <laughs> by uh, your acknowledging me. I appreciate that. I think that this speaks uh, uh, in total uh, well, volumes of the commissioners that you guys work so hard, so uh, diligently, so conscientiously, and uh, you're supported by great staff. And uh, you know they work hard, and sometimes you know there are uh, challenges, obviously, because you know. You need directions and guidance, you know, from the city council oftentimes, and uh, that's why I come in. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, work very well closely with commissioners, staff, and obviously the public. And uh, so, uh, but because, you know, we all are very diligent, working hard uh, for the good of the public, you know, uh, we, we've come a long way. So you have worked very well together. So I want to express my sincere thanks to uh, Director, you know, Singalakis, because uh, he has been very supportive, and he's at every commission meeting. So, uh, 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 so I appreciate that. And uh, I think uh, you know, uh, Council Member Robertson, uh, we're very lucky to have her uh, to you know be the liaison. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned I do have high, high bars. I said high standards. So I'm sure she will <laughs> have no problem you know, with meeting high standards. But I'm glad that she, she, she hears it. <laughs> so you will strive and work hard to do that. Uh, my, you know, the thing I have to add is really not much, except that we know transportation is one of the biggest challenges for our community, uh, our well-being, well our quality of life. Uh, our business vitality, uh, it's all transportation. If people cannot move, you know, they're not going to come here. Uh, and I think the, uh, the thing that, one thing that bring, and also, you know, Councilmember Jennifer Robinson mentioned correctly, the implementation is going to be challenging. And uh, as a result, I think the approach that it's been 
uh, talked about. You know, you talk about education, encouragement, enforcement, engineering, equity, evaluation. These are all very important. And they are essential elements you know, to the successful, successful implementation. And, and I think I'm very hopeful, optimistic, that you know, one of the, the, the things that brings all us together uh, when we implement it, we're not fighting, fighting. We're not taking, fighting our own territories. But we are fighting, we are working together for the one solution. That is through technology. Because technology provides safety. Everything we talk about, safety, safe street, safe people, safe uh, speed, Space. safe everything, safety. And so we all share that in common, no matter whether you are a, you know, a bicyclist or pedestrian or car or uh, transit. Uh, because, you know, I think that's why you, the approach that the city's taken is through multimodal solutions by utilizing technology, which is common in providing ultimately safety. Doesn't matter what you get safety, it's safety. So I think that uh, it's really something that will bring us together in our city's object goal, you know, is uh, we talk about a smart cities uh, program, or you know, vision zero is one, and transportation system, autonomous vehicle, and the smart cities, you know, programs, these are all tied together. So I believe that if we can see that and use that collaborative approach, working together, solving the common goal, problems, and I think we'll be successful. So I really commend you uh, by, you know, working in this fashion, and I look forward to a very, very wonderful work that will be developed you know, through what you're doing. So thank you very much, and I obviously I support uh, what you have proposed. I think that's a very excellent approach uh, that will make Bellevue continue to be a place where people want to come here to live, to work, and to raise their family. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member Zong, former Transportation Commission member. Yeah, so thank you. I remember when we worked on Vision Zero when I was on the Transportation Commission. And to me, this is really a testament of what we do in Bellevue, which is taking um, we're always looking at industry best practices and taking it to the next level, right? So when best practices was talking about Vision Zero, we, we looked at that um, carefully and thoughtfully and we adopted that. And then as the industry starts to move towards the, the um, safe systems approach, right? We looked deeply at that. We had uh, many meetings and engaged with the community to say, um, is that something else we should be leaning into and broaden that thinking beyond just vision zero strategies into the broader framework and holistic view of safe systems? And I really appreciate that because I, I think it's a testament to the fact that we don't sit on our laurels. We're always looking and scoping the landscape at what best practices look like. Um, I remember actually hearing some of this work when I was back in DC for the Transportation Research Board at the World Resource Institute, and they talked about the fact that as you look at this holistic view, which is we're all in this together, how do we really move this forward? Because it is not a one-dimensional um, problem or solution. And I just keep thinking about the fact that it is the, and I think several of you mentioned the, the, the only answer is zero. And to me, that is really the beacon, right, that as we create and continue to create and develop this safety culture, that is, that is the goal and that's what we're actually constantly thinking about in our decision making. And so I, I'm really excited about um, this work and moving this forward. I did have a couple of questions. Um, one is that as we think about this work, are there other partners and grant opportunities to help us with some of this work that we're doing? so that we aren't doing this alone. Um, so I don't know if that's one you can answer now or just um, come back later. We're, we're always looking for those opportunities, <laughs> yeah. both official mm -hmm. as in uh, the state uh, grant program. We're getting ready to finalize our grant application for uh, state safety funds. So that's imminent. 
but we're always looking for those opportunities, rest yeah. assured. Because it just seems like, right, data-informed, systems-based, technology, there <clears throat> seems like there's probably grant opportunities yeah. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then it also seems to me that you talked a little bit about uh, WatchDOT <clears throat> or, or region, but the school district is another one which is very <clears throat> local. So as we think about their own transportation strategies, is this an area that we can um, show them what we're doing and really talk about what they may want to adopt? And I think uh, Councilmember Robertson talked about also the regional. So, you know, folks that are here are traveling from here somewhere else. So what are the other cities doing? Is this uh, something that they may also be interested in or have, has anyone in our vicinity actually adopted this already? The city of Seattle is the only other city at this point uh, to have adopted Vision Zero, but other cities. But the safe system are, strategy. Oh, safe approach? system, not not specifically, not in Wash, other than the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. Okay, so that may be a good opportunity to do some outreach and see because, you know, we we don't have a, a wall between the cities. I mean, people are traveling throughout. So the Washington Traffic Safety Commission is actually. Uh, you know, is the body responsible for updating the safety plan for the state? So that's pretty big that they adopt, they had adopted the approach. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, just a thought. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Stokes. Yeah. Again, uh, very big thanks to both the commission and the staff and and working together. I mean, teamwork is is what makes it work, and you know that. Uh, and getting the uh, community involvement uh, has always been important in transportation and. Um, You've done a great job on that. It's 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 good to see that. One of the things that we're working on, and, and you know because you're even focusing on this part of it, but as we grow in Bellevue and have uh, the downtown livability and other pieces implemented, the transportation piece is, is going to be the glue that makes all that work and sticks together. And it's, and it's a huge problem uh, and challenge, I, I'd say. Uh, you know, challenges and opportunities there, and we're working on that. Uh, and um, regionally, what's interesting, and I'm getting back to coming down to this and why this is so important, and it's, it's great to see this pathway, is that regionally, Bellevue has been uh, for years now out in, ahead in innovation, uh, working with that uh, in various ways, and uh, even things like 5G and other pieces are all tied to this. It's, it's a complex system, and transportation makes it all, all run. Uh, the second one is... is uh, the issue of uh, safety and mobility, how that works, and we've been working on various things along the way, uh, you know, from from a lot for again from a long time. Uh, and the other is uh, the neighborhood connectivity. Uh, and again, that's you know we had a levy that was uh, went out on that uh, and other pieces. And again, we're getting we're learning that. And, and it's 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 accelerating as to how what we need to do and having roundabouts in the neighborhood and all that's something that five years ago even we wouldn't have kind of thought oh, that's a weird idea. Uh, so we're we're in a rapidly changing and the commission is really pushing that along and going with, kind of leading that part, which brings it down to the exciting thing and I think the kind of the the shining the crown on this is the Vision Zero. Uh, commitment. I mean, that takes a lot of commitment, and in order to make that work, you have to have all these other pieces part of that, and and to set the tone on it. So I think you've done a really a tremendous job of that, and tying it together in a very very deliberate way, and uh, then uh, and, and you have you know safe, effective, and and uh, you know really uh, proven work that you put into it. So. It's a whole package, and what you've done, and, and what the commission has done in this last round, is kind of take all these pieces and working with you know, the staff to put it together, because this Vision Zero Action Plan ends up with what you want to have as transportation where people don't get killed and maimed, and you're working on that. And um, it, it's just a tremendous job, and thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I'm very much in favor of this. It's great to move this along, and... Uh, and the hard work comes up. 
So thank you very much. Council Member Barksdale. All right. So thanks so much for all the work that you've done uh, on the commission and staff for the for the thoughtful uh, work and, and analysis. I'm really excited about this, and also um, I like the inclusion of the data and re refining uh, the the uh, the strategies based on the data. So. Um, I'll just say, you know, transportation plays a really big part in, in community um, and, and how we relate with each other, right? Kind of to the point of the fact that it connects, but also um, when we can navigate our community and feel safe and, um, and get around, I feel like that really makes an impact on the quality of life in Bellevue. So I'm uh, excited about this work and we'll support it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <coughs> Chair Wu and Vice Chair Leitner, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Council Member uh, Lee, thank you for all your great work in uh, developing this or help, uh, working with the Commission to develop this great uh, plan. And I'm sure that, uh, in fact, I know Council Member Robertson's standards are just as high, so I continue to see a lot of great work <laughs> from the, from the, from the Commission. <laughs> Well, it's it's a great presentation, and I hope you do pass along back to the commission that how thankful we are of all this of all this great work. And um, um, we do need to be a leader in this arena for all the different reasons we've said around this table. Um, and I echo a lot of those um, great remarks from my colleagues. Um, and we do have a responsibility for the safety of everyone in our city. It's one of our utmost. Um, uh, issues that I think all of us think about and want to ensure all the time. Um, and, and speaking of that, um, one of my questions on the, um, on, on the data that we were tracking was go up to 2018, correct? Um, and I'm assuming that we probably saw a spike in 2019. Um, was there a reason, to, or was part of these strategies developed with 2019 in mind, or was there a cutoff date and you didn't have a chance to analyze the 2019 data? So thank you for this question. Yeah. I forgot to dic disclose that. No uh, worries. We don't have yet the audited 2019 data, but our understanding is that there's a uptick of uh, where it has been, so thank correct. you. Correct, correct, absolutely. Well, that's good, I'm glad you're aware of that. Um, uh, and, I, and I think even more reason why we need a quick implementation of so many of these strategies, because we did see that spike uh, in, in, in 2019. So the pressure's on even, even more to ensure that we don't see that again uh, in, in, in 2020. Um, you know, we've done a lot of talking about, about data, and I'd just like to drill down just a little bit on that, because I'm always one that likes to say that we're always data driven here, but we're only as good as what we're tracking in data. So uh, we don't have to go through all the strategy, but can you give me a sense of some of the key data points that we are tracking? Because even though our goal is you know, no serious injuries, no fatalities, that's the ultimate goal, but what are some of the data points to ensure that we are on track and if we need to tweak any of these strategies that we can in a very fluid fashion, tweak those strategies? Right. Sure. Uh, so uh, we've been slicing and dicing the data in, in many different ways. You, you saw a reference to several of those in the presentation using our high injury network, so mm -hmm. which quarters have a high occurrence, and then also delving, uh, drilling deep into the police reports to see contributing factors. But we also look at uh, the data by time of day. Uh, we look at uh, the nature of the roadway on which it's on, the speed limits uh, along those quarters. So the, that's, that's just kind of a, a starting point for the assessment. And then we delve into some of these more um, advanced level assessments, the uh, video analytics work. And, right. and in the next couple of months, we'll be publishing three reports um, uh, that we'll be sharing with the broader community. There was talk about that. We published the paper for, for ITS World Congress, so we'll see if we're accepted. But um, we're doing, that's going to provide a, a wealth of information on Good. where speeding is occurring mm -hmm. and uh, where we observe those close calls that provide those early warning indicators uh, so we can be more pro proactive as opposed to uh, waiting for people to get hurt. So that's okay. that's our ultimate objective. Good. And even though the examples that you gave are more based on vehicles, I'm sure we're tracking the data for cyclists, for pedestrians, Absolutely. et cetera. Okay. So just to add, add on to that, so in alignment of with the goal, so I mm -hmm. think the bottom line is uh, the number of fatalities and serious injuries on our streets. And for those, do, uh, you know, for those serious 
in, uh, injuries do occur, uh, you know, a lesser degree of uh, seriousness. So. Terrific. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for the great work, and I'm supportive of this moving forward. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody out here and the entire community who have participated in this. It's been very helpful. I appreciate seeing Cascade Bicycle Club's thumbs up on this, and um, I, I want to say that I think there's only one thing that's more dangerous than not having a safe program or a Vision Zero, and that's having a partially implemented one. <laughs> so when we start to implement this, I hope we go full force and get it fully implemented as soon as possible. Um, I really do like the education piece of this. I think it's really important you address the need to educate the, the non-motorized vehicle operators and the motorized vehicle operators. I don't consider an e-bike a motorized vehicle operator, just letting you know. But, um, you know, you're educating both everybody on the road, and I think that's really important. Um, the one thing I would like to see a focus on, if we can, I'm not sure if it's included in this, is we have a lot of people moving into Bellevue from all over the world, and I see people with baby strollers right on the edge of a sidewalk with cars going over 40 miles an hour a foot away from them. And it just scares me to death, and I just think is, you know, I think there's a trust factor because they've... I, I would too, I mean, I'd assume, I guess this is fine. And it's really not, and it really is dangerous. And I think we need to kind of educate people on being super aware of the danger of, of have, being this close to a car and, and you know, kind of, I don't know, you, you come up with a plan, but I think we need to address that because we have a lot of incidences uh, where we have sidewalks and fast moving cars with not much separation. So I guess um, if we get a motion to approve this, we can have this back on consent calendar in so, yeah. two weeks. Okay, hold on. <laughs> We're going to let the <laughs> deputy mayor do a, a, real a, a real motion, not a motion. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, well, motion to have this uh, come back on consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <clears throat> Great. Good work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe we have a half hour break here, which is kind of nice. So uh, we can. You know what I was going to ask before you all go? I'm wondering if we could do a group picture with all the community members who have worked on this project. Would you be interested in that? Can we do that? All right, let's just take a break and we'll come back.
All right, thank you. We're going to reconvene here and uh, we're going to do some uh, city manager's report for uh, the regular session since we have some time. And if we could get Council Member Stokes, Council Member Lee, <laughs> Council Member Barksdale, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's. That's six out of seven. I'll yeah. take that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, Mayor and Council Members, um, we are going to, uh, we have one, a couple items under the city manager's report. The first one is uh, really uh, an update to you on one of your council priorities of identifying and implementing technologies that improve customer service with the city of Bellevue. Staff is here today to give a brief update on the city's strategic website and social media work. And joining us this evening is, as, as you know, is Brad Harwood, our Chief Communications Officer, as well as Saver Snyder, our Chief Information Officer. With that, I'll turn it over to you two to, um, to provide the uh, report to them. Uh, thank you, City Manager Miyagi. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, and Council Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, opportunity to, dis to discuss some of the uh, great collaborative work that IT and communications um, are doing to better serve residents. Uh, this work uh, specifically touches on uh, City Council Vision Priority Number 23, uh, which is uh, to identify and implement technologies that improve customer service uh, with the City of Bellevue. Uh, to begin, um, I'd like to highlight uh, the growth uh, Bellevue has had in its social media channels. Uh, Bellevue's social media channel channels are a valuable tool for informing and engaging residents, workers, uh, businesses, and various stakeholders uh, in the city. Uh, currently, the city has official feeds on Facebook, Nextdoor, Instagram, uh, and Twitter. Now, over the past year, from January 2019 to January 2020, we've seen encouraging growth um, in our uh, followers and reach, and just some highlight, uh, highlights, which uh, is uh, you can see in the slides, uh, is a 25% gain uh, in our Facebook followers. A doubling of our Instagram uh, followers and a threefold growth in um, our next door reach. Uh, more numbers you can find in the agenda memo. Um, so, why is this important? Well, expanding our audience allows us to effectively and proactively communicate with residents. Uh, examples include what we've uh, essentially seen over the last week with the COVID 19 virus, having a reliable, accurate uh, channel. Uh, uh, to uh, talk with people is very important in these scenarios, um, but it also helps us create community uh, and interact with residents and, and uh, workers. And we accomplish this by advertising events, um, programs and services, and uh, a more lighthearted example you can see up there is, for instance, a Parks Ranger program, um, or even uh, every Thursday when we do our, our throwback photos. So uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Sabre Schneider. Sure, thank you, Brad. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the gains we've seen in website access. Some of you were members of the council about three years ago when we did a significant website upgrade. Um, and some of you may remember about two years after that, we changed the underlying platform, um, although largely that was invisible to the public. Um, that work has paid off tremendously in a 31% growth in um, unique visits uh, and unique users between 2018 and 2019. So some of that data you can see in the memo and in the slide. Um, I thought some other uh, interesting tidbits that Google Analytics shows us um, top search terms for jobs, land use code, comprehensive plan, business licenses, and summer camps. Uh, so it tells you a little bit about what was on people's minds, at least in 2019. Um, people browsing the website um, in languages other than English, so they have their browser set to a language other than English, 
Um, highest, uh, highest population is Chinese, followed by Korean, Russian, Japanese, and Spanish. Um, those numbers have also grown tremendously over the past year, um, a little lower than the overall growth, but um, anywhere between 5 and 25 percent, depending on the language. So I thought that might interest council. Um, lastly, about 41 percent of our traffic is now um, coming from mobile devices. That was an important thing that we wanted to do when we updated the website a few years ago, and we continue to make the mobile experience better and better. Um, and uh, that's a big reason why that we're just seeing so much of our traffic come from mobile now, which is not wildly unusual. Um, a couple other, uh, we talked a little bit about some of the GIS and mapping work um, when I came to present on our third place win in digital cities. So I wanted to highlight a little bit of the mapping applications um, here to talk a bit about what's been done. Uh, we cover a few more of them in the agenda memo. Uh, Building Bellevue is a mapping application that I think most of you are familiar with that shows work in the pipeline. Um, a new application that IT and the fire department developed in partnership last year is the Community Risk Assessment web application. Um, that provides an interactive map both for the public and for the fire department to assess risk in different areas and track different things that are happening so the public can kind of self-assess their own risk and the fire department can decide where to put energy um, and, um, and help people get ready. Uh, a few other applications that you've heard a little bit about this year in previous presentations, the illegal fireworks reporting application um, that was used over the 4th of July. Um, about two years ago, Council uh, probably recalls passing um, the small cell wireless work, uh, and carriers have since asked us for maps so that they can figure out what poles might be eligible to add small cell or 5G. So another GIS project was producing a small cell wireless facility map. Though it's not a feature yet, eventually there'll be a feature that shows what poles are reserved and what poles aren't on that map as it matures. Um, then a few other applications and services. Uh, you heard from the fire department a few weeks ago about their fire inspection application. That provides tenants with an immediate electronic report of findings and tenants can self-correct uh, self small issues without requiring a reinspection. So that's uh, a new customer service deployment that was done this year. The accounts payable automation project allows vendors to support, uh, submit invoices electronically and verify payment status via a portal so people that are doing business with the city can do that a little bit easier. Uh, the Power BI water quality dashboard continues to mature as part of the smart city plan. So you've heard us talk about that a couple of times. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, the city continues to partner with the eCity Gov Alliance to onboard three new jurisdictions into my building permit, which is SeaTac, Edmonds, and Woodway currently, with many others in the pipeline. So this work definitely continues to see how we can continue to better leverage technology and communications to improve service across the city. Great. Thank well, thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Any comments or questions, Council Member Stokes? Yeah, one question on back on the uh, frequency of uh, contacts on the top search terms. Mm -hmm. well, I'm surprised uh, that you didn't have parks and uh, ball fields and related type uh, recreational activities. Is that, I would assume that's pretty high. They are included in the top 30. Um, okay. They just weren't in the top couple, and we didn't want to list them all there. Yeah, I know. Right, yeah. Just curious. yeah. So we also saw swimming. Um, we did see a lot of recreational classes, yeah. parks, trails. Those sorts of terms were definitely, I think, in the top 30. Okay. Great. Uh, do, should Great. we just go around the table? Oh. Councilman Burksdale. All right. Thank you. Love this. Um, just a follow-up question in terms of are we deciding what data we collect and what our targets are and how that feeds into our goals for the city? Great question. Um, I think the website and social media may have 
slightly different answers there. Um, we in IT partner very closely with Brad's team of PIOs to sort of determine what those targets and goals are. We do collect some Google Analytics data. However, we probably don't collect as much as um, you may be used to uh, due to uh, some of the privacy concerns that we have in place and we wanna make sure we maintain that for residents. Uh, so we work very closely with comms to track different campaigns and then provide data back out to them about those campaigns. I don't know if you want to say any more uh, about that. No, just to, to augment that. Uh, communications uh, collects our data, our, our engagement data quarterly, um, and that's a good snapshot of what is actually working and where sh we should um, our, use our focus or, or spend our resources. All right, Deputy Mayor, you and how. Thank you, Mayor. Um, great presentation. Thanks for the update. Um, always like to see this. and. Um, I guess my first question is to you on social media. Um, is there a strategy to have um, an equal balance amongst the different departments to have a presence on, 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 on social? The reason I ask, so for example, like transportation has a presence on Twitter, but not on Facebook. Um, and then you'll see like the arts program has a presence on Facebook, but not on Twitter. Can we, uh, I'm not sure if it's a goal to be consistently across probably our two, um, are two of, uh, of maybe three most uh, popular social media platforms if we could get the various departments all to have a presence on there, or is that not part of the plan? Uh, that, uh, that has been in flux since okay. I got here. Uh, um, at least when uh, the city started going up on uh, social media, there was no, or there was certainly probably not a, um, a centralized strategy to it. Okay. Um, Right now, we have a presence on channels uh, based on interest and, and feedback from the community. Okay. For instance, for transportation mm -hmm. and, and uh, police, right. uh, that's real time and very Twitter appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still some channels or some departments that are kind of uh, hanging out there that probably shouldn't have a specified channel. Okay. We have worked hard um, as uh, a strategy which will we'll probably uh, eventually incorpor incorporate into the, uh, the council priority in regards to the comprehensive communications plan mm -hmm. uh, to have a consolidated presence yeah. um, so that uh, people have a reliable one-stop shopping. I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree. Same just with the consistency of what we're naming the channels as well. So for like example, with the economic development um, on Facebook, it's economic vitality. On Twitter, it's choose your way Bellevue. So if someone was looking for our economic development team, there might be some confusion there. So um, just wanted to make a comment on that. To the website, um, what is... Um, and, and this was very helpful data, but just want to drill in a little bit more. What's our what's our session length on on our site right now? Um, and then also, what's our bounce rate so we know that people are getting to um, the pages that they're specifically looking for, the information that they're specifically looking for? Yep, I'm doing this from memory, so okay. I will follow up and email. Okay, if no I'm problem. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bounce rate of about 52 percent. Okay. Um, and I think the session length is about four minutes. Oh, really? Um, oh, that's great. Which is a little shorter than it was last year, which right. we were actually taking to be a good sign that people were getting to what they needed to get to faster. Absolutely. Um, but I'll confirm that in email to all okay. of you because, again, it's that I'm doing that from memory. So we have the top search terms, but what were the most popular pages on, oh, on the site? Oh, good question. I can get you that. Because not everybody too. searches, although I'm sure quite a few do. But I'm just curious if they might get. Yeah, their not everybody through. does search. Okay. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just I can get you top one. pages. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, Councilmember Robertson. Oh, sure. Um, so, I, I I have to say the website is so much. The search function used to be terrible, and now it's really good. Um, I love, of course, the code uh, where you can look at old versions of the code. That's just brilliant. Very few cities have that. I also really do appreciate how many topics we have general pages on. Um, and for the most part, with some exceptions, they all have links. So that if people, most people just want the general answer, but if they want to go read the code to have the links there. I have heard a couple of people say that they had some problems where there weren't links there, but then they contacted staff and 
it was fixed. So they added them. It was an oversight. So I think that that's an, a tremendous service. Um, I echo Deputy Mayor Newenhouse's comments about I, I'm an avid Twitter and Facebook user, and I follow all of the Bellevue's pages, and um, consistency on naming and consistency on between the different platforms I think would be really good. Finally, and I'm going to raise something that I'm really surprised uh, Deputy Mayor didn't raise, and that is um, I think I don't know what the capabilities are of the My Bellevue app, but if we don't have if we could possibly enable that to send push notifications to people. Not that we, and I don't want to spam all the users, but if we have late breaking stuff with this public health things, if there's a fire in a certain area, if, if we know where people live, we can let them know when there's roads close near them. That would be such a great service because not everyone goes on next door, and even people who are on next door don't use it all the time. But it, most people have their mobile device. And if we could send that emergency notice out on Twitter, but also push it to people, I think that would be a real benefit. Um, so I don't know, and I, you probably can't answer that on the fly, but um, as we're using the My Bellevue app more and more people are subscribed, I'd like some data on that. Um, it'd be great to see us increase those capabilities. That's great. So, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lee. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Deputy Mayor about the uh, use of this, you know, uh, you know, or technology for economic development, I think. I think it probably needs to be more, again, coordinated to have uniform uh, uh, images and so on, and maybe the messages can be more easily pushed out. You know, it already exists, and but you just need to be coordinated somehow. So need to have a little bit more emphasis. So I agree. Second, I have a question is, uh, multi-user languages, you have so many people coming in. Is it, and define and if and you find out what top search t terms are. The, are the information available as to what language are looking for what particular uh, search areas and what are most in, uh, looked for or look after or sought after topics within and, uh, so each language within the language, okay. so that you can kind of tell from. You know, people are looking for it. Just is there any particular, uh, n you know, uh, interest or need uh, from a particular population? Mm. So that'd be nice. The second question is, uh, when say 40 or 25 percent or 9 percent or 21 percent, that's the number we have for uh, last year, 2019. Does it show how many are dropping off? Or how many are signing? Staying with you, us, or how many new people are signing on? Uh, you know, so if you can find that out, be be nice. Mm -hmm. So it's not just they lock on once, yeah. then they never land again, and then you know, while well, they're going up because there's always going to be some new people sign up, but we're we're not keeping them there. So I think it's important to know that we're they're finding it useful, mm -hmm. and if they're not, what do we do? What kind of you know topics, uh, as uh, W may mention? You know, parks and other services. What attract them? We can or get economic you development. Too. You know that they say, "Hey, I'm logging on, look at it continuously. You're providing the right information. They will try follow you. If they don't, just once, well, we have some problems. They're not going to grow as fast. So that'd be good to have that information. Maybe if you have them, we'd like to share with us. But if you don't, maybe we should stop collecting this. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, Council Members, I. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to say that I really do appreciate the mobile um, feature. Um, it's user friendly, and I think it's helpful that more people that may not be carrying larger devices can actually get to what they want to do. And I really like the fact that on many of the pages, it has the contact name and the info in there. I notice it's not all of them, but in the hot topic area, most of them do have that information so that someone that reads that and says, oh, I got a question, actually has that the at your fingertips information. So I think that part is really helpful. Um, I And on the website, I was also curious, so you talked about languages on the website mm -hmm. and being able to tell. So when we talk about social media, is there also that opportunity to, um, 
engage in other languages when we push information out using social media? Uh, generally, that relies us on us uh, translating the content. So and we are. Uh, oh, sorry, and is that sorry. one of the the areas of expansion Absolutely. that we're talking about? We've been very strategic about um, to making sure it's efficient uh, of what we translate and when we when we uh, push it out. Um, obviously, the best example of that is the recent snowstorm. Um, but that's something we're working on, uh, developing a uniform policy with the uh, language access policy, uh, which we should have by the end of the year. And then also, uh, again, combining that into uh, uh, the comprehensive communications plan. Yeah, I think strategy. that'll be really helpful. I, I like the consolidated plan. Um, my question is, when we talk about the 25% gain in in, engage, in touches, is that how many of the people are engaging versus just reading or hitting the like or something like that? Is there a way to tell? Yeah. Uh, like and what are they engaging in it, when they engage with us? I don't know if I, I might be able to break that down, but it, we just normally get, at least what I have in front of me is just a general engagement number, which includes the like, shares, comments. Um, okay. I was just curious that as we kind of look at the data, is there a way to tease out the, are there certain areas that people are just more naturally engaged in versus just being a, a viewer of the data? So Animal pictures. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> okay. It's and true. then, um, then my, we, we all love animal pictures. Um, <laughs> and then my last question is, as I think about the GIS and the future of that, um, what are some areas, because I know that people really appreciated um, the traffic part of the GIS, being able to go and, and click on a camera and just see, you know, what the traffic's like in that area. I don't know if we have something similar to that as we think about emergency response and um, being able to, for people to see that here may be some places that in an emergency would be a place that might have, right, shelter or supplies or or something like that. Um, so I'm just curious about what future expansion of GIS mapping we're thinking about. Uh, we definitely do partner with the Office of Emergency Management and any kind of EOC activation to provide mapping support. And that's both internal mapping support and mapping support for the public. So the kind of thing that you describe, you know, identifying on a map where people could go get supplies or find shelter or get help uh, is something we've definitely been working with OEM on. Um, we are uh, currently also working with the Department of Transportation to uh, think about how to do more video on the maps, um, on some of the traffic maps while still uh, maintaining our privacy standards. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's always a, an interesting trade-off. Uh, so there's a number of areas. It's probably one of the uh, biggest growing areas in IT right now is figuring out how to leverage more of our GIS to send out information and develop services around it. Um, and then I guess my question is, just like with the transportation presentation earlier, you know, we our community um, goes into and out of Bellevue into neighboring areas. So is there a more regional look at GIS mapping so that our community is actually getting information just broader than Bellevue? The, there is. There's actually a group out of King County right now that's um, talking about ways we could all partner better in the region. Um, that work has been going on for about two years now, and Bellevue participates in that conversation. Um, and that regional group has been trying to figure out where are the right places to engage as a region, how do we avoid duplication of efforts across governments. So those conversations are happening. Um, I. Uh, we so haven't, is there, we haven't is landed there anything on an that has yet. actually come out of that in terms of like the first pilot or product? Um, not yet, but it has been a while since I personally have engaged in that conversation. So there well, there well may be an outcome, and I just don't know. Maybe about a separate it yet. conversation. Yeah, like I can find out and let you know. Thanks. Okay, Council Member Stokes, you have it. one more thing. Yeah, one real quick thing I want to mention is. Uh, I really want to applaud you, and, and the, the big increase on the Bellevue Washington uh, Facebook piece, I love that. I send that out to people all the time, and I get a lot of interesting people like seeing that, and it really puts a face on Bellevue that is amazing. 
I mean, they're great shots, you know, the city and the mountains and all that stuff. And it, it, it's, I think it's, it's uh, one of the better pieces just in terms of overall, uh, this is Bellevue. And uh, it's wonderful. I appreciate that. Yeah, Council Member, I mean, uh, Deputy Mayor Newhouse. Thank you. Since my colleague brought up the app, I thought we need to chime in now. But, um, <laughs> but on, on the app, so um, currently if you were to, for example, uh, report uh, an illegally parked car or something along those lines, you would get a notification back that the issue had been addressed or they're looking into it. However, beyond that, do we have the ability right now, because I did bring up push notifications probably a year or two ago, if um, there is like a, you know, another massive snowstorm, do we have the ability right now to send and uh, even if it was unsolicited, a, a push notification to everyone who has um, actually downloaded and installed the app on their mobile device. Do we have that capability now or not? I'm pretty confident that we still have that capability. We still, you do? Yeah. Okay. And have we used it at all yet? No. We, uh, we used it a couple years. Um, I think it's been a year or two. Okay. It was, uh, we used it in regards to um, some public engagement we were doing on, a, on an issue. Um, Okay, okay. I'd like to see us we'll, use yeah. that a little bit more going going forward. And also just want to be clear that we are here separating the difference between the app and the website when we talk about mobile, though, right? I mean, we're talking about the site being mobile, responsive, and, and viewing that through. Okay, just want to make sure that data point was right. But great update and love to see this growth. And uh, I think the social media channels, including Nextdoor, which we really haven't talked about, are increasingly important for our community to keep them informed, engaged, and alerted to... Um, either coronavirus or be the snow, uh, we can always push out those uh, notifications and alerts as quickly as possible. So thanks for the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got two more things uh, we could do before our next meeting. Um, we have a planned absence request by Council Member Lee, and we have a remote participation request from Council Member Zahn. So if there is a motion to approve uh, both of these things, I would take it. So moved. Go ahead, make the motion. So moved. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Is there a second? Okay, second. <laughs> all right, We're all those in time. favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, fine. We are dismissed. And <laughs>
My neighbors and I are here tonight to protest the destruction of our beautiful trees on 148th Avenue and Northeast 8th Street as PSE prepares to install a redundant power line. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why do these people keep coming to us about this project when there's nothing the council can do to stop or change it? Here's why. As our elected representatives, we look to you for leadership and truth, and you've let us down in three ways. Number one, the city council demonstrates no vision or engagement on citywide energy policy. All important decisions are driven by PSE, a private corporation whose first allegiance is to the company's Canadian and Dutch shareholders. Our community values, our trees, and even the overall reliability of our electricity are secondary considerations to the shareholders' profits. Number two, the city has a responsibility to inform and educate citizens about projects of the size and impact of the Lake Hills transmission line. However, the only uh, notice of the cr crucial land use hearing was through the city's confusing and legalistic blue permit bulletin. As a result, only nine citizens attended the hearing in 2014. Most residents found out about the power line project when the Bellevue Reporter published a story four months after the hearing, long after the time when any appeal could be filed. That is a travesty. Number three, the council's deference to PSE deprives our city of modern innovations and lower energy costs. In its latest financial report to the SEC, PSE says that solar panels, energy efficiency, and other smart solutions will threaten sales of uh, electricity and natural gas. The company views innovation not as an opportunity, but as a significant financial risk. PSE's business model requires the company to saddle our city with old-fashioned energy technology from the last century. Each of you has told me that burying the line on 148th would be expensive and difficult. But Seattle is putting a power line underground from T-Mobile Park to South Lake Union as part of its Denny substation project. That line will carry the same voltage as ours, but it's a mile longer and more challenging to build. So why can't Bellevue do what Seattle is doing? Tonight, we are asking you to be bold, courageous, and equitable. Show us you are committed to extending the beauty of Bellevue beyond downtown and the Grand Connection. Please tell us what you think right now so my friends can return to their families and the other things they hoped to do tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. So, Hello and thank you. I'll keep this short. It's clear that an error occurred and here we're talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the redundant line on 148th and 164th, uh, up to 164th. We should learn from it, discuss the issue, and improve so that we don't repeat the error, because it will happen again otherwise. It appears that the process was followed, followed in granting the, the permit for this action, and it seems like nobody wants that action now. Council may not be able to change the outcome of this decision, but it can change the process, and I think that's what needs to be done. I can see a couple of possibilities. One is to increase notification of pending decisions and their impacts. We can ensure citizens coming to meetings, and especially those opposing a decision, understand the right to appeal, which I believe everybody knows now. So that one would be very easy. It's possible to increase the time to, for an appeal, especially if, I, as I understand, this, this started just before Thanksgiving in 2014. Uh, that's a terrible time to have that kind of a deadline, especially for people that aren't used to processes. And the last thing is to improve quality improvement measures throughout the city. This is going to lead to better decisions. Um, I, I know at least two council members here are already familiar with, uh, with quality improvement. They know how valuable those can be. It will lead to better decisions. It will also reduce 
can rather reduce processing time and improve efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's our next speaker? Lorraine Stewart. Ms. Stewart. Hi there, my name is Lorraine Stewart and um, I am a cyclist in the community. I ride with the Cascade Bicycle Club and currently a ride leader. And I just wanted to thank the council <clears throat> for um, supporting um, the safe strategy framework um, in the study session that we just attended. And I, I wanted to just tell you my story briefly just to show the impact that um, a decision like that can have. This is a map, this is a crash map from the Vision Zero um, portal. And um, a few of you were talking about data and statistics. I'm a data point. Um, I was hit by a car in, uh, in Newport Hills on um, April 14th, 2016. Um, and it's changed my life. Um, I have permanent injuries. Um, things that will live with me forever. I have a disfigured hip that I have to look at every single day of my life. Um, and and it's a gift that keeps giving because as I get older and I do things like run and, and ride, my body doesn't work the way it used to. And so it just, I, I come up with new things like every year that's, that's wrong with me now um, that I can trace back to that day. Uh, pelvic fractures, broken shoulder, head injury, um, ripped open knee. I was hit by um, an unattentive driver. He w had his eyes closed. Um, he was two blocks away from his house. Um, he was 18. He was, um, the speed limit was 25. The, the eyewitness um, and, and the reporting, uh, the police officer thought he was probably going a little bit faster. He was two blocks from his house. All he had to do was turn right to go to his house, and instead he drifted into the intersection um, and hit me instead. Um, I would, he hit me from behind. I never saw it coming. Um, so there's a lot that the safe, um, that safe drivers um, <laughs> and safe vehicles and safe speeds all play into um, what can make an impact on the community and people's lives because these are all just dots. Um, God forbid a circle, you know, representing a fatality. I was just a serious injury, um, but I just wanted to thank you again for um, your decision to help us move forward with this important initiative. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Okay, who's our next speaker? Next speaker is Ralph Gudix. Mr. Gudix. Gudix. Um, I emailed in a six-page document with a bunch of pictures to all of you. Did everybody see it? Read it? Okay. Do I have to go through it, or should I go through it briefly? Sure. You have all three right. minutes. I've, I've built a little house at the bottom of 179th Lane Southeast 30 years ago before it even had a name. It was a dirt road. The city annex, 11 years later, the Westlake Sammamish annexation area. Some of you probably weren't even around here then. And it apparently still hasn't figured out that when you annex an area, you take on the infrastructure, in this case, surface runoff from I-90 and a piece of Westlake Sammamish Parkway, and you maintain it. I was out of town on a work trip for 94 days leading up to Christmas Day. I got home Christmas Day evening fell getting from my driveway to the front door of my house, and you see what I was tripping on. Ruts through my driveway. Uh, hundreds of pounds of gravel that was part of my driveway, now on my front porch, now in my carport. The catch basin at the bottom of the, near the bottom of the hill, where it goes into a 30-inch outfall pipe into Lake Sammamish, was completely plugged. I've got a picture there on the face page. How can you not, for 19 years, not maintain the infrastructure. When I got somebody out the next morning, he said, oh, we have 40,000 of these. We can't keep them all clear. What are we paying five figures in property taxes every year for, even on my one-room house, if you can't maintain the infrastructure that you acquired from the county, which acquired it from the city? You've got a valid easement. I have a copy of it issued by WASDOT in 73 when they put in, when SR90 became I-90 down there. It's all fully documented. Anyway, I did submit a claim like I was told to do after two months to your risk department. I got back the letter you see there saying, well, we might get back to you in a month or a month and a half. 
I'm tired of living in Bellevue. I want to sell. I can't sell now because anybody looking at it will say, whoa, does this happen every year? Does the city try to flood you into the lake? And I also found out last Wednesday when I had somebody out to give me a quote on repairing the damage, he said, let me look in the crawl space. Four inches of water now. With his four inches of water now, last week on February 26th, how much was there two months earlier when it flooded and I wasn't here? Or what if it flooded four months earlier? Was it two feet of water? What kind of mold and insects am I going to get? I think that's my biggest worry, living on top of a Petri dish instead of coronavirus. I want it fixed now. I don't want to have to pay for it myself first, seek reimbursement. The city trashed my property. The city needs to fix it now. Thank you very much. Alex Zimmerman. Hey, Mr. Zimmerman. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <clears throat> my Nazi Gestapo demo pick from Animal Farm, a fascist, anti-Semite, killer, and pure cretina. I want to speak about agenda number six, about management. Mm, because I know you almost for 30 years, and every day when I wake up and go and try to speak, and I speak to her hundred times, thousand maybe. I try to understand why every day we go more and more like what is I call fascism with idiotic face. Why we go more stupid and stupid and stupid? 30 plus year ago when I come to Bellevue, a nice beautiful city right now is dangerous. And I explain to you why this happened. Everything that has come right now comes from Seattle fascism. And this Seattle fascism control everybody right now. Why this happened? Seattle fascist, by definition, is a pure criminal. And I give you a classic example. They violate voting right act federal. This uh, absolutely criminal is supposed to be prosecuted them, all counsel, totally. Why? They have a four Latina who represent seven percentage. They not have one black who represent seven percentage black. They don't have one Jew who represent 7% Jew. They don't have one yellow who represent 15% people. It's a federal crime. Before we not stop in Seattle fascist with idiotic face, like criminal in bandita, nothing will be changed. Consul Mosquito bring a new constitution last year, 10 pages of new constitution. Cannot imagine this? And you all quiet about this. Can country quiet about this? Olympia idiot quiet about this. Ten pages a new constitution. In this constitution, I love this constitution. Right now, in this constitution, I'm supposed to be love my consul. When I don't love my consul, I will be trespassed. I have 11 trespass for 1,200 days from Seattle. Will be prosecuted from King Country Consul. I prosecute this now case in court, and right now I speak to you. But Bellevue is this intellectual city. Why so many idiots sit in this room and very quiet? Well, everybody want to be nice. I know this expression. With honey, you can catch more free than with vinegar. Uh, George Washington did this. Avram Lincoln did this. Or Roosevelt did this. Guys, I speak right now to everybody. I'm sick from 150,000 idiots. And 51 percent who come from jungle, who don't understand what's going on right now, and how we can stop in this idiotic democratic fascism. Stand up, America. Thank you very much. OK, Mr. Allen. No, Mr. Allen. Mayor Robinson, members of the council, my name is David Allen. Uh, my address is 201 2nd Street South in Kirkland, although I was a former uh, neighbor of the mayor in the Woodridge neighborhood. Yes. Mayor, I hope your rad power bike is still working well. <laughs> I'm here to say thank you for reaffirming Vision Zero with a tangible plan to make Bellevue safer for pedestrians and cyclists. So thank you very much. I truly appreciate what you are doing I'm also here to say that it's important to keep building safe bicycle infrastructure. So I have two jobs, two hats that I think are relevant to this. One, I work for Bikes Make Life Better, and what we do is programs for large corporations 
that want to have more people bike commuting. So we help them get people on bikes. Second, I own a company called Bike All Over, and what we do is training for uh, bike-friendly driving for commercial drivers. So those two jobs have really given me an insight to what's going on in the downtown cores where you have a lot of workers, and in this case, you have just from one company, 15,000 more workers coming to your downtown. Uh, and there will be other companies, and there will be more workers. Uh, so, Vision Zero, fortunately, helps you with businesses and with your citizens. I mean, we've already heard what it's like to be hit when you're on a bicycle. Um, and she, thank God, survived. Uh, what I want to say is what you have done as a council in the last few years has made a conscious decision to make Bellevue a true city. And with that come real responsibilities. So if you're going to have a downtown core that is going to have this many people trying to get to work every day and get home every day, you simply cannot have that many more cars or Ubers or any kind of vehicles that are going to come into this downtown core alone. You have to be using every single mode of transportation. People have to get to work in any single way that's possible. And they just won't do it if you don't have a good bike infrastructure. The curious but cautious, if they feel like they can't safely get to work, they just won't try. So I urge you to continue to work on the good work that's already being done with the spine of 520, the East Trail, and I-90. You've got ways to get into Bellevue. Now you need to get ways from the trail into the downtown core safely. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. So we have one more spot for somebody to speak uh, against the 148th project and one person to speak in favor of bikes. We, I know we have two more speakers, so. Mike Main. Mr. Main. Hi, my name is Mike Mains. I've been in construction for over 40 years. I was born and raised in West Seattle. I know all about Bellevue. I've been out here for 30 years. I used to live on Lake Sammamish. They started here to have all underground wires for a reason. So we didn't have the storms. We didn't have power outages. We had a nicer place to live. We had that gated community. And now you're telling me PSE that works for us, works for you, works for all of you? PSE works for us. They're not telling us what we're going to do. This is a neighborhood that is 21st century. Do you really want to see wires in the air? Seriously? And you, you should know better. Thank you. Okay, we have one more speaker. Olivia Sun. Ms. Sun. Welcome, Ms. Sun. Hello, my name is Olivia Sun, and I'm a Northwest Bellevue resident and senior at Inner Lake High School. A few months ago, I had the privilege of partnering with the city of Bellevue, Bellevue School District, and Washington DECA to launch a teen anti-distracted driving campaign called the Tune In Not Out campaign. I was inspired by our city's commitment to achieve Vision Zero, and with some help, I transformed this idea into a month-long project carried out by my high school's business club in October of last year. Throughout the month, we implemented various awareness activities, ranging from safe driving reminders at football games to a pop-up concert centered around distracted driving. We also conducted a before and after survey, and our efforts seemed to correlate with a 22% increase in student commitment to distracted free driving at our school. Now, despite these successes, it's really important to acknowledge that this conversation around building safe streets comes, will not and should not end after a single month-long project like we did. Real long-lasting change comes from a sustained collaborative effort. And that's why I believe it is so important for the Vision Zero Action Plan to be 
truly collaborative by including voices from teens like myself, as well as city government leaders like you all. I hope that the city makes sure to adopt a grassroots approach in which those who are leading the change are those who are being served. And to effectively do this, the city needs to continue partnering with young people and combating issues that affect them, whether it's teen distracted driving or education or arts and culture within our city. I am proud that our campaign enabled our 125 club members um, to develop and apply real world business skills to drive change. And as an aspiring entrepreneur, this is especially meaningful because I believe that a business mindset can be a powerful tool for not only earning money, but for creating positive impact. And of course, hopefully we've shown that when youth are really invited into the conversation, we become positive influencers of our local community. Now, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about this initiative, um, the write-up will soon be added to the Vision Zero Partnership website. Um, and I just want to say that leading this initiative has motivated me to con continue learning about urban planning. Um, I'm currently a transportation planning intern here at City of Bellevue, and I'm really excited to um, probably pursue um, a major in urban studies at Stanford University in the fall. Hmm. Um, and then finally, I would like to wrap up by giving a huge thanks to Franz um, for being a really supportive mentor and for you all for listening here. And I appreciate all you do. Thank you. Congratulations. Could we get a picture with you? Oh, sure. Okay. Let's. any more speakers to speak about anything other than pro trees or anti 148 there was one additional speaker signed up okay however, it was for a topic where we've already had three speakers so there is no further comment okay well, we will move on then um, we have no reports of the community council boards or commissions but we have another item uh, from our city manager thank you mayor and council members uh, as you mentioned uh, you added an item um, an update on the coronavirus. Um, the uh, update is timely given what has happened this weekend in both our region and our nation. So joining us this evening to give the update is Nathan McCallman, our Deputy City Manager, uh, Andy, Andy Adolphson, our Deputy Fire Chief, and Police Chief Steve Milet. Nathan. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newhouse, and members of the Council. Uh, of course, this topic is of highest importance for the community and, and our nation right now. So we wanted to make sure that we got in front of the council with uh, information as it's unfolding. Uh, the city of Bellevue and its partners have been taking this very seriously actually since the beginning of January when we learned about the first case potentially migrating to the United States. And sadly, as you already know, six uh, lives have fallen victim and our hearts go out to their loved ones this week. Uh, we want to thank the first responders and medical personnel that serve these, uh, the, those who are still struggling with the disease. Uh, and Council should know that the coordination is, has actually been very extensive uh, from the city departments uh, to our jurisdictional neighbors here in Western Washington, to King County Public, Public Health, and, and as high as the federal government with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so with that, uh, Acting um, Fire Chief Adelson, We'll now walk the council through some of the facts and events that have led up to today and the potential next steps. All right. 
Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening on this important topic. Uh, I'm Andy Adelson. I'm the Deputy Fire Chief for the Fire Department, uh, and I am uh, standing in for Chief Hagen while he is out of town, reassuring our accreditation uh, at the uh, International Conference in Florida this week. He will be back on Wednesday uh, evening. He sends his salutations. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to go open with a summary of the current situation. Uh, in King County, we have had six deaths uh, because of the coronavirus. There are 18 other reported uh, cases that have been confirmed that uh, I am aware of uh, after checking the uh, King County Public Health website uh, about an hour ago. Um, all of these cases have been um, <clears throat> out of, uh, have the, the patients have died at uh, Evergreen Hospital, and for the most part, they have come out of one facility that's not inside the city of Bellevue. All of the people who um, have died of this um, are people who have been uh, older and have had medical issues that um, were significant enough to contribute to their uh, demise, unfortunately. We have seen expanded testing uh, just over the weekend. Um, the Shoreline facility where they can do testing in Washington State for this has expanded its capabilities to 100 people per day. And um, so in doing so, they've expanded the criteria for who they actually test for coronavirus. And you'll hear uh, different terms for coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus is one you hear most often. However, it's kind of a misnomer. It, the corona family of viruses is what it falls under. It's uh, often referred to as COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So you might see all of those names in, in the public. Um, one of the things that's been indicated by uh, this new expanded testing is the fact that uh, they're suspecting now that the uh, disease has been more prevalent in the community than we suspected, and it's probably more widespread than uh, what we had thought in the past. Um, <clears throat> This, uh, King County is currently working on some plans for isolation sites for patients that um, start to show symptoms so that we can keep them isolated and keep them safe and treated and keep the public safe also. It's important to remember that this is a public health emergency and therefore King County Public Health has the knowledge, the resources and the legal authority to um, best uh, mitigate this situation. Dr. Dushin, the head of King County Public Health, is actually a very well-renowned and acclaimed uh, infectious disease doctor uh, who's known uh, not only nationally but internationally. So I am very confident that we're in very good hands as far as how this is being handled. Over the weekend, over 24 uh, officers from the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta came out to Seattle to assist with the local effort in containing the virus and investigating how we can better um, help the citizens uh, and the people who are in this area. It's very important to know that it's better, um, to be better informed is to be better prepared. As City of Bellevue, uh, one of the best things that we can do in helping with this whole effort is helping with the communication of messaging to the, uh, the people of the east side. Through this, um, we have been vectoring people to the King County um, Public Health website, the State of Washington uh, Department of Public Health, and also the Center for Disease Control. Some of the nice things about all three of these sites is the fact that they have uh, material that are in different languages than just English, uh, several languages in several cases. I had a couple examples that I can present to you. I'll leave these out for you if you want to take a look at those later on this evening. <clears throat> um, the city webpage has been set up so that once you go to the, the splash page, the initial page that you come across for the city, uh, you can see a, 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 an immediate link to several of these websites. So we've made that information available for everyone. Uh, our feeling when I talked to um, some of the different leadership within the city was that uh, if we wanted to provide this information, we wanted to give information that went straight to the first source, not try and repackage it. Uh, and have run the risk of having outdated information or information that was inaccurate because of our interpretation. The city uh, itself has been taking several steps uh, to prepare for this response. Uh, we are keeping uh, our, our employees well informed. Uh, we're conducting regular briefings both through email and through teleconferencing. Uh, city departments have been implementing their uh, continuity of operations plans, also known as COOPs. Uh, we're fortunate enough that a couple of years ago, um, Curry Mayor in charge of OEM uh, ran uh, all the city departments through a swine flu scenario, very apropos in the setting. And uh, in doing so, they found um, some issues that have been fixed, and they also did updates so that these uh, 
uh, plans are better, uh, better set for if we actually have a large scale issue here. Uh, they address things like uh, telecommuting so that people can stay home and work from home, uh, and also uh, items like um, lower staff modeling, so if uh, people can't make it into work for vital functions. I feel um, that we are prepared as a city for this situation, um, thanks in great part to the planning of the Office of Emergency Management, and I feel like I can say confidently that the city of Bellevue is open for business and will continue to be open for business. Chief Milet is here to discuss um, part of uh, the regional effort to prepare for this response. Chief Milet. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and Mr. Miyake. When the media started reporting on the appearance of coronavirus in China, your police department and fire department started discussing for the potential of the virus to migrate to the United States and specifically to our area and our city. These early discussions enabled us to prepare for the situation we currently find ourselves in. Additionally, both the Bellevue Police Department and the Bellevue Fire Department began to work with our regional partners to ensure the lines of communication were open, we were sharing information throughout the region. And as a team, we were prepared to confront this monumental challenge. Both agencies, the fire and police departments, are also networking with our uh, police and fire agencies around the state and the country. As I speak, the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs is preparing and disseminating a best practices document, which is recommending how officers, police officers around the state, can perform their duties while protecting the public and our employees from this new virus. Here in Bellevue, we've already made some adjustments to our processes to reduce unnecessary exposure to both the public and our employees. For example, our dispatch center, NORCOM, has started the practice of doing some screening questions or asking some screening questions of callers, asking them if they have flu-like symptoms. If the answer is yes, our officers are responding with the personal protection gear. Um, if we end up getting dispatched along with the fire department for a medic call, we are staging nearby and we are waiting for the medics and the firefighters to call us forward. Now, of course, if there's an emergency situation or it's a criminal event, we will respond as we normally do. Every patrol car is equipped with a personal protection kit to include a high quality face mask. We are in the process of updating our online reporting system to expand the types of incidents that can be reported online. Our goal, again, is to protect the public and our employees from unnecessary contact during these challenging times. We're also developing information videos to reassure the public that their police department and fire department will respond when they need us. There's still a lot that's unknown and that's coming at us. But I, I say this with the, most with the greatest sincerity that I believe this city is prepared to deal with the challenges that are gonna be brought forth in the future and we will get through this together. At this time, I'll turn the microphone back over to uh, Acting Chief Adelson. I think there's a few things that we need to remember about this, and anybody who's been following the news will have heard this over and over again. Uh, like many diseases, the best way to contain it and keep it from spreading are to um, follow some easy steps. Washing your hands on a regular basis for at least 23 seconds is the number that they've come up with. Uh, using soap or uh, disinfectant if you can. Uh, maintaining uh, social distancing, which means that uh, if you're around somebody who is ill, uh, staying at least six feet away so that if they do cough or, or whatnot, you do not get uh, the transfer. Uh, if you are yourself sick, covering your cough. Uh, if you cough into a napkin or a tissue or something like that, throwing away that tissue right away instead of carrying it with you. Um, and this cannot be said enough, if you're sick, stay home. Uh, it's critical, and I know that a lot of people have a strong work ethic, have the feeling that um, they need to get the job done, and that's much appreciated 99% of the time. However, in situations like this, it's critical that we don't spread disease by coming to work sick. Lastly, um, do not go to the emergency room unless it's essential. The emergency rooms need to stay open and functioning and um, have the capacity to care for those who are critically ill. And so um, if we um, 
clog those certain nursing, uh, those emergency rooms with people with minor symptoms, we are uh, doing everybody a disservice. The suggestion from King County Public Health and from Washington State uh, Department of Health is that if you um, do have a cough, a fever, respiratory problems, to contact your physician and ask how to proceed from there. Thank you for this time this evening. I was hoping to see if you had any questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Council members on, shall we just go down the line? Yeah, thank you for the update. I know that um, in times like these, information is rapidly um, changing as more information is known. And so um, the more that we help the community with the most factual information, and so I appreciate the fact that we're referring folks um, back to the Board of Health for information. Um, I know, and I, I think that it's, it's good to acknowledge the fact that this is really tough work for our community, for our first responders, for our medical professionals. And so the more that our community stays calm um, and is not, because I've been hearing that, um, I think Dr. Duchin earlier today at their press release talked about the fact that there's been a run on you know, face masks and things like that, which, um, you know, his recommendation is the face mask or for if you're sick, not to, right, sneeze on or cough on other people and also for our first responders and our medical professionals. And so um, we just really want to make sure that we uh, communicate with our community about what the individual things that they can do are um, to keep themselves safe and also not to um, make other people ill. And, and take care of the supplies for the professionals. I do think that one thing we probably want to be careful of is I think it's very good advice to hand washing and also stay at home if you're sick. But I think we also have to acknowledge that there's probably those in our community that if they're not working, they're not making um, a wage uh, money in order to survive. And so whether that's um, as realistic as we'd like to think that it is, um, I think there's just something for us to, to think about. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Robertson. Thanks for the thorough uh, report. Um, I know that uh, I have every confidence that the city of Bellevue is prepared. Um, a couple of questions, um, or maybe just one question and a comment. I have learned today that the cost of the testing is about $3,000, and um, I don't know if that's true, um, and that a lot of people's insurance don't have the insurance to cover it. What is the public health um, department doing? Because knowing who has been infected and being able to trace it is one of those key um, things to be able to trace how it, the pathway of a disease. Do you know what public health is doing with regard to getting the testing out to people who need it without regard to their ability or their insurance ability to cover it? Um, I am not aware of the cost of having the testing done, and that's the first uh, time I've heard that raised, so thank you for bringing that up. I'm, okay. I will now look into that and try to get back to uh, the council about that. Um, I do know that um, even though we have expanded, or I shouldn't say we, the Department of Health has expanded their capability of testing, um, it is still rather limited to, uh, given the population of the area. So uh, right now they're looking about uh, testing uh, about 100 people a day in, in Shoreline, which certainly isn't a vast majority of King County and the, the surrounding area. Uh, so they still do have rather um, stringent criteria for testing. It's just expanded from what it had been in the past. Okay, great. I and and I, my numbers could be wrong, um, but someone who'd been looking into this gave me that number today. Um, there's someone in our community that's being tested, and they weren't tested before because it was 3000 I mean, anyway. Oh, no, and, I, and, and, yeah. and very certainly at times um, the cost of health care can be prohibitive to some individuals, and that's Ab unfortunate. Absolutely. And there, I'm sure there, there's people that are asymptomatic or have such mild that they will never even think to get a test. But if there are people getting who want to be tested, I would hope our public health department would figure out a way to do it so that we can track things. And you bring up a good point, is um, the vast majority of people who contract this disease will uh, have a moderate or mild or even asymptomatic uh, disease pattern. It's a very few that actually um, become critically ill or will die from it. It's similar to the flu as far as the uh, those rates go. Absolutely. We need to be very careful not to pass it to, especially older adults or fragile people. Um, I also wanted to make a comment that if this is in our, in our, I've seen where some people won't talk to their friends who maybe have family members from China 
because they're afraid of getting the coronavirus. I, I really hope that people don't do that because a virus doesn't decide it's going to just go to one ethnicity or not. I mean, that's I hate to see that kind of xenophobic approach. I would encourage yeah. people to look at the map. Yeah. And it is all over the globe. Exactly. That was the point I was trying to make because I hate to see that kind of thing. Yes, our neighbors ma'am. are our neighbors are our neighbors and let's care for each other at a distance and not cough on each other. <laughs> and then wash your hands. Thanks. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Uh, good advice. Um, thank you so much for your uh, for your uh, for your update and your reassuring words. Um, uh, there's no doubt that we are managing this as best as we possibly can, and we're on top of it, and uh, and Bellevue's prepared to, to, to handle it going forward. So just a couple of quick questions for you, um, just because I get this question a lot, and maybe this is best directed at uh, Acting Chief Abelson. So um, what is the tipping point where we might have to say, stay home, do not go to work, cancel events, um, uh, you know, the, the Governor Inslee had a press conference today saying we're not at that point yet where there's a statewide kind of ban on everything from Sounders games to, to school, et cetera. But is there, is there a certain tipping point that we're looking at when we do encourage people not to go to events or um, school or work, et cetera? You know, much of this is determined by the local um, health uh, authorities and not by the state necessarily or by the city. This is a um, something that the health department has the author the legal authority over. Uh, there may be some advice that might come out. However, uh, okay. really, that's something that we want to leave up to the public health officials because they're knowledgeable. And in certain situations, it may be uh, okay to stage a mass event for one community that wouldn't be right for another community. And I think mm -hmm. uh, Governor Inslee uh, also alluded this, to this. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis uh, made at the local level by the, the local health board to make the best decision for that local community. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, sorry I couldn't give you something more. Definitive. No, that's 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 fine. Absolutely. Um, and then a question for uh, Chief Milet. Um, unfortunately, there's some folks in our society that never want to let a crisis go to waste. So looking for opportunities. I mean, we've had price gouging on Amazon already of, yeah. of uh, everything from Purell to masks, et cetera. So um, have we had any uh, instances yet in our community where people are looking to take advantage of our most vulnerable populations or our, our, our seniors and, and take advantage of them in any way yet? To my knowledge, no. Good. Nothing, to my knowledge, nothing has been reported to our police department. But I know the news is starting to report on it at different places around the state, and we will be vigilant on that as well. Thank you, and thank you both for all your efforts. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Councilmember Barksdale. All right. Thank you for the updates. Uh, it's, a, it's a serious virus, and I've, I've seen one of the charts that really shows the prevalence over a short period of time, so it's good to hear uh, that we're preparing for it. We have some members of our community who are not on the Internet. Um, how are we communicating with them to make sure the word gets out? So we just, actually on Saturday, we came up to the City Hall to talk about this very issue. And we're looking at different um, um, methods to get the message out, to include coming up with some flyers and putting them at the convenience stores and asking business to partner with us, the library and such, to get you know flyers and other means of uh, communicating that message out in multiple languages. And again, we're, we're working as a team to, to challenge ourselves to make sure that we are, and it's a great point, not everybody has internet capability. Yeah, I might encourage also thinking about uh, phone tree, like, you know, yes, making sir. calls. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chiefs. Uh, thanks for the first responders, for the people that, you know, work for you and work for us uh, in the fire department, the police. You are the first responders. You, know, you are right there. You're taking a lot of risk and uh, more than you know, usual because of uncertainty and because of uh, the amount of uh, you know, cases you have to take. So thank you. Um, I think uh, the most important thing, I appreciate you know, that you are looking into this uh, scattered information out there. Uh, people need to know that you are on top of things that there is communication to them. Uh, they know what they should do, right? Uh, some people, are, we are looking after them. And uh, so I think the fact that you're telling them the personal responsibility, that's definitely a, the, the, the first and most important thing and probably the most personal responsible thing that we can do, personal responsibility. And um, uh, so the question was asked about language. 
You know, I think that's important because communication means you have to let them know, you know, in a, mean, uh, in a, in a way that they understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I'm not quite sure. I don't want to know exactly, but I just hope that you will take that into consideration. Hopefully, you already have that under your your control. So make sure that you know language is uh, appropriate in disseminating the information that we're talking about. Uh, the thing that I I am concerned is I hope uh, Councilmember Robertson mentioned you know how much cost to do a test. I hope that's just a uh, informational purposes. I don't ho I hope that they are not charging people for taking tests. I hope the ability to pay, I hope that's not a factor. You know, if it is, I think we need to know, we need to figure out how to address that issue. Uh, so um, I, so please, please let us know. And I'm sure reasonable people would not let that stand in the way of, you know, saving people's life. Uh, they, I, don't hope, I hope they don't ask, can you pay or can't you pay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Stokes. Excuse me, we don't um, do a back and forth with the audience in our regular council meetings. I don't know if you have your hand up for a question or just to, le just to let you know. Okay, Council Member Stokes. Yeah, uh, I really uh, appreciate all the comments my uh, colleagues have made and uh, we're all very thankful for the responders. Uh, and I think this is such came on so quickly and of a scope that has um, caused a lot of people. You know, we saw pictures of people going to Costco and climbing up in the shelves and <laughs> all of that. People really react, overreact to this, um, and it's but it's a, it's a balance. Um, and I think we have to keep in mind that so far, uh, the normal flu uh, will actually harm a lot more people than this seems to be. Uh, but it's still serious, um, and, and we don't know for sure how that's going to happen. It's a big challenge. And what I think is interesting in this, and I appreciate the comments all up and down the, the, the podium here, is that we, this, is a, this is an opportunity to, or, or to, to take advantage of our commitment to diversity, our commitment to unity, our commitment to health and as a universal um, part, and that we're all human beings. So we're not, you know, the issue of, well, this is all caused by China, this is all caused by China or whatever, is not accurate. And, and we're coming together and doing things the way that, if we could apply in, in other areas, would be great. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing, the way we respond. And I'm really, really um, proud of the way Bellevue and the region is responding. I think we, you know, we got hit pretty hard at the meet, at very beginning, and so I think we're responding very well. It's just that we are approaching this on a very positive, non-panicked, uh, but very uh, universal way, and that is that's great. And I think people will, in the long run, appreciate that, and will actually probably save more lives and more people uh, get well. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank I you. appreciated meeting with the emergency response team Saturday morning and very organized, earnest group doing good work here in our city, and we appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm. I know some cities have um, declared some type of a local emergency to, in order to access federal funding, and I wonder if our city has considered that in order to be able to pay for testing or for anything um, that might come up that's costly that we need to do to control the situation. Is that a question to me? It's to somebody. I apologize, because I'd be above my pay grade, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, can the city manager maybe look into that for sure, me? Sure, that's something that's on the, that we're taking a look at now. Yeah. Great, okay, we appreciate it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, next on our agenda is the consent calendar. Motion. Okay, so move. Second. On the <laughs> Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Yeah, I did. That's fine. So moved. Okay, in a second. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Great. So uh, the public hearing uh, we're going to have tonight. We're going to have. Excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Marsh. 
Just Mr. Marsh, you, you are interrupting the, the um, meeting that we're having right now. This is not the time. If there is a public comment that you'd like to make at the end of the meeting, I will give you an opportunity at that time. So any, we're going to continue with our meeting. And we have a public hearing right now. With Mr. Miyaki, would you like to introduce? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you. As you mentioned, item 9A is a public hearing authorizing the release of uh, some utility easements. Uh, back on February 3rd of, of this year, uh, these easements were declared surplus, and the date for tonight's uh, public hearing was set. Um, following the public hearing, the council will be asked to take action on the proposed resolution to release the, the easements. And joining us this evening is Ira McDan, our Rural Property Manager, to provide a brief staff report. Ira? Uh, thank you, Mr. Miyaki, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we're here tonight to assist in holding a public hearing and to receive direction on a request to release five utility easements uh, and a portion of a sixth utility easement located within proposed development near the intersection of 106th Avenue Northeast and Main Street. Um, tonight's public hearing is to allow the public an opportunity to comment on the release. Um, the property is being redeveloped as a part, and as a part of their permitting process, we've received this request to release the utility easements. Um, Utilities Department have reviewed this request and confirmed that the easements are no longer required for continuing public uh, utility service. Now this slide may look a little bit busy because there are six easements involved in the request, which is more than we usually deal with at a time, um, but all of them are similar to our typical um, utility easement requests in that um, all of the utilities within these easements have been either abandoned or are being relocated into new easement areas. Go. So this uh, slide shows the, the new easement areas. This consolidates the, e the utilities into a new easement corridor on the west side of the property. Um, so there's sewer drainage and uh, water facilities as a part of this, and uh, new easements will be conveyed as shown. Uh, before we open the public hearing, I'd like to mention that one of the properties listed in the agenda memo and the published resolution was included in error, and we've provided an amended resolution in your desk packets to remove the address, and the corrected version is what we will be asking council to approve following the public hearing. Um, this is the end of the staff report. Are there any questions before opening the public hearing? Do we have any questions? Uh, council Member Lee. Thank you. properties now zoned for this is a single family or what no, are the uses um, I'm not sure off the top of my head it's downtown oh, zoning. Downtown. okay oh, are wow. there any other questions okay so uh, what we'll do is we'll take a motion to open the public hearing so moved to open the public hearing second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. all those opposed Okay, we'll have a um, three-minute limit per person or recognized community organization to speak in favor or against this motion. Do we have anybody signed up to speak? There are no speakers this evening. Okay, and nobody here is speaking, planning to speak. Okay, so do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, let's uh, see a motion to... Approve resolution 9741. I move to adopt resolution 9741, amended to remove the reference to 10510 Main Street. Second. All those, is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And it passes. Okay. All right. Um, that is it. I think that's the end of our meeting. Are, is there anybody else who would like to speak? on something that hasn't already had three opposed or three four on. Okay, we will uh, adjourn. <laughs>